John chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. We are going to start in verse 14. My favorite restaurant in the world is called Fogo de Chao. Any fans in the house? It's called Fogo de Chao, and it is what is called a Brazilian churrasqueria, which I think is Brazilian for awesome meat house. Because... I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this kind of restaurant, but you basically walk in, you pay a fee, which is very expensive. So this is my favorite restaurant, and I never go. I just dream about it. You walk in, you pay a fee, and you sit at your table, and you have this glorious little disc in front of you, and it is two-sided. On one side it's red, and on the other side it's green. And as long as at your chair the thing is flipped to the green side, these brilliant men named gauchos. They walk out of the kitchen, they're dressed in like this with like white shirt and they have a red bandana around their neck and they are armed to the teeth with spits full of beautiful, glorious red meat. Every cut you can imagine, cooked to every temperature you would like and they will come by your table and if your card is green, they will offer to freshly slice some off of their steak and put it on your plate and it is awesome. And I don't know if you're like me, but every time I go into a place like that, I make it my personal mission to make them regret giving me all I can eat. (laughs) I just think to myself, maybe this is sinful. I don't know. I think I'm going to make you pay for letting me do that. I love it so much. It is so good. I, I mean, I walk out with the meat sweats like you wouldn't imagine. It is awful. I don't eat for three days when I'm done, but it is worth it. It is awesome. Now, Fogo de Chao is an experience. It's an experience. If you ever have a special occasion and you love red meat, you should definitely go. Now, I heard tell one time, um, I don't actually know this person and I'm thankful that I don't know them because we would probably have some words. A friend of mine told me the story that at one point, uh, they went to Fogo de Chao with someone and the the, uh, one of the other people that they were with, they walked into Fogo de Chao and instead of paying the price to get the full experience, they paid a substantially discounted price by their preference to only eat at the salad bar. I know, I know, it's just ridiculous. Can, can you imagine, can you imagine having such an incredible meaty experience at your fingertips and you choose the salad bar. I, I, I can hardly imagine anything more foolhardy than that. You got something, but you definitely didn't get the full experience. And I think oftentimes in our lives, what we do when it comes to our relationship with God is we, we get a taste of something that God has given to us. We get a taste of some like loving relationship with another person or a joyful experience or we get some, some experience of pleasure or some experience of purpose that is derivative of the goodness of God and we settle for that thing instead of going after the one who gave us that thing. So we, we, what we do is we fixate on this thing, on this, on this object or this person or this goal or this feeling and we say, this is it. This is what I need to truly fill me up and fulfill me but we ultimately end up hopeless and longing for more and empty because we got something but we did not get the full experience. We need to go beyond the things and go beyond the people. We don't just need a taste of the good things that God provides. We need a full experience of God himself. So loved ones, please don't settle for the salad bar when the whole meat offering is available to you. (laughs) Don't settle for less. Don't settle for the things that God gives because he is ready and willing to give you himself. And he has done it in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see this morning in a message that is part two of a message we started last week, this big idea, it's the same big idea as last week, a full experience of God depends upon the exclusivity of Jesus. If you want to fully experience God, you can. He is available to you, but you must experience him through the person and work of Jesus Christ and through him alone. So we're gonna see together what this exclusive experience of God looks like as we wrap up 
this literary unit, verses 1 to 18, that's often been called John's prologue to his gospel. So let's read it. I'm going to start in verse 1, but we're going to pick up our study in verse 14. And if you're new uh, to Christ Church this week, you can catch the previous two messages on the website. First, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. A full experience of God depends upon the exclusivity of Jesus. So the question we asked last week and the question we began to answer and we'll finish this week is this. What are the components of a full experience of God that are exclusively available in Jesus? If I really want to access God through Jesus, what is it that I will experience? And last week we got the first two of five and this week we're going to get three. Three exclusive experiences. So last week we did this, exclusively in Jesus, number one, I receive spiritual light. Number two, I obtain supernatural adoption. And this week we begin with number three, I grasp supreme glory. I grasp supreme glory. Look again at verse 14. John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. There is, <laughs> there's so much to do here, so we're going to move. John picks up here this theme. He, he calls back this word, the word, which he hasn't talked about since verse one. But in the first week of our series on John, we talked about the word who was in the beginning with God and who was God. This has been identified as Jesus. We're gonna see he's actually gonna be named in verse 17 of this paragraph. This is Jesus, the word. He is the divine being, the second person of the Trinity who has been eternally existent in perfect fellowship with his father. And now we learn this shocking, amazing truth in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh. So John starts with what we uh, call this idea of incarnation or infleshing. This is, this is what's happening. The word becoming flesh is the divine second person of the Trinity, the divine son of God who has existed as a spiritual being for all time in fellowship with the father. At a moment in history, he took on flesh. He got a human body and a human nature and he added it on to his divine nature. Now, at this point, this is one of those things in the Bible that just, you're like, yeah, I don't get that. Welcome to the club. That's like every Christian ever. Like you can't, it's hard to understand, but we can begin to grasp the beauty of it. And at the very least, the wonder of the mystery of it. I mean, think about it. We've already learned in John's prologue that Jesus, the word, is the agent of all creation, that he is the light of all the universe and life for all men. He himself, in his divinity, 
divinity in his infinite capacity is the fountain that overflows onto creation to make everything that is good and true and beautiful. It's Jesus Christ, the eternal God. Historic church uh, declarations have called him God of very gods. And yet here, he lives in a human body. He becomes incarnate. He becomes enfleshed. What is infinite entered a finite existence. What is transcendent and far away and utterly different became imminent and like us even in his vulnerability. The eternal one entered time. The boundless one entered space. This is the God of the universe becoming a human being. And if that doesn't boggle your brain a little bit, something's broken already up there because this is a wild idea. Some would say this is the most scandalous idea in the entire Bible that God himself could take on human flesh, especially at the time that this was written. There was, a, there was this predominant Greek view of what's been called Gnosticism, that the spiritual realm is good and the physical realm is bad or evil. So what we're trying to do is kind of escape our flesh and our bodies and kind of ascend into the spiritual realm. And yet here, God is not doing that. God is descending into the physical realm to become like us by taking on a human body. And what we're gonna learn here is that this is how we grasp supreme glory is through the incarnation. This is so amazing. This is like the author of the story entering the story. This is like the one who is creating the whole universe stepping into it. It's, he's like, Jesus is pulling a Stan Lee from Marvel. You ever seen a Marvel movie? You know, the random old guy that appears for like a half second in every movie? That's the guy who created the whole Marvel universe. He, he wrote the whole thing into existence and then he steps into it. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's the author of all life and he is stepping into the life that he created. He's becoming like us, his creation. And all the major controversies and errors in the church for the first 300 years centered around misunderstandings of this idea of the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus combined in one person. Now, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we stretched our brains a little bit by thinking about the Trinity, about a, a triune God who is one in essence and three in person. And here we learn about something that is a bit of a reverse Trinity. If you want to impress your friends, if you want to sound theologically capable but socially out of touch, just this week, <laughs> use the phrase hypostatic union. Use that phrase, because that's what's going on here. That's what theologians call kind of the reverse trinity of Jesus' existence, because the trinity is one, one essence, three persons, and Jesus is one person with two natures. He has a full and unblemished divine nature, and he also has a full and uncompromised human nature, and those are combined into one person, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. He took on flesh and entered time space, entered human history, so that we could see his glory. And that is, that is mega grace from God mega grace from God. How does God describe this incarnation? Through the Holy Spirit, through John's pen. Look what he says. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you could read in the original languages, you would see that this says he tabernacled among us. And if you've read your Bible, you think, oh, I know the tabernacle. That's from when the Israelites were wandering in the desert and they needed a place to meet with God. So God gave them very particular instructions through multiple chapters of the books of, book of Exodus. And then they constructed this tent that could be quickly taken down and, and moved to a new place in the wilderness. And then they would construct it again. And the glory of God would fill that tent so that God could meet with his people who were living in exile. And this John, who is brilliant calling us back to these Old Testament themes is saying the word became flesh and he built a tabernacle. He built a tent among us. He built a tent and lived among his people. The tabernacle was the only meeting place between God and men and now Jesus shows up and says, I'm the new tabernacle. I am the meeting place between God and men. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And then this, this is the grace. This is why he came. He became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The radiance of the beauty and the majesty of God is on full display in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And what John is saying here is we, and he's specifically talking about him and the apostolic band, the guys who walked with Jesus and worked with Jesus and lived with Jesus and traveled with Jesus, we have seen his glory Glory as of the only son from the father. Jesus, like we said, has existed eternally in relationship with the father. And this tells us that he is the father's one of a kind son. Maybe you've heard this phrase, he's the only begotten son. Simply, uh, but not easy to understand, that means for all eternity, the son has been begotten of the father. He is equal with him and yet he proceeds from him eternally. The father and the son for all eternity have been relating to each other as father and son and Holy Spirit. Now, he's the one of a kind son, he's unique, and he oftentimes, especially in John's gospel, he speaks of the glory that he had before he was incarnate, the glory that he shared with the father. And now John is saying that glory, the unique glory of the one and only son who he had with the father, now we have seen it here on the earth. And the fact that we've seen this glory is going to become even more amazing. The first disciples, they were witnesses to the glory of Jesus Christ. They saw his perfection and his power. They saw his teaching. They witnessed his miracles. They saw his love. They saw the way he reflected the kingdom of God, the way that he healed and restored and taught. They saw his glory close up. And then there were three of the 12 that got to see what's been called the transfiguration. It's this episode in all of the synoptic gospels. We actually don't get this episode in John, but there was a moment where Jesus took three of his disciples and they went up on a hill and for just a moment, the flesh that veiled his divine nature was peeled back so that they could catch a glimpse of his divine glory. And it says that he, the text says that he shone so brightly that they couldn't even see him and that it was such a glorious moment that Moses and Elijah showed up to hang out with Jesus he was showing forth his divine glory. This is, this is an amazing thing that John is telling us, that God himself has entered human history, has become a human so that we can see his glory. We can witness his beauty and his majesty. This description of the glory of Jesus, it inevitably, like I said, draws our minds back. Already he said the word tabernacled. But even this next phrase that he's going to use, he says, glory as of uh, the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. It draws our minds back to the book of Exodus when God revealed his glory to Moses. There's this scene where God is basically like, okay, you guys are all wicked. You're all rebellious. I'm giving up on you. I'm going to start with someone new. And Moses is pleading with God, begging with God. And he's saying, if you don't go with us into the promised land, then, then I'm not going. Because it is your going with us that makes us unique, that makes us special. And so he says to God in Exodus 33, he says, show me your glory. He says, I want to see your glory. <laughs> and God, I love God. He's like, God's like, well, slow down there, pal. Okay, that, that's not going to happen because you can't see me. If you look upon my face, you will be incinerated in a second. So I recognize you want to see me, but we're going to learn in a second. No one can see God. So he says, you know what I'll do? I will let, not my face, not my fullness, I will let my goodness just kind of sweep past you as I hide you in a rock and I cover you with my hand until you can barely catch a glimpse of my back and you'll see a little glimmer of my goodness and that will show you who I am and that will show you my glory. And so... Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock and God passes by and as he passes by, he's declaring his name to Moses and he says this in Exodus 34, six, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, that's Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
those two Hebrew words at the very end there, steadfast love and faithfulness, are translated into Greek as these two words right here, grace and truth. Grace and truth. What John is unequivocally saying to us is that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who split the Red Sea and brought the plagues on Egypt and collapsed on the tabernacle in a cloud and a pillar of fire, who opened up the ground to swallow up 185,000 rebellious people, who healed the sick, who has accomplished miracles and spoken the world into existence, Yahweh, the God of the universe is now in a human body and his name is Jesus. And he came so we could see, so that we could grasp his glory. There is something in this life that fills you with awe. Maybe it's art. Maybe you listen to a beautiful piece of music or you watch a film and it, and it moves you and you're struck with awe. Maybe it's nature. Maybe you look out at a starry sky when you're up north or you look at a beautiful mountain range and you just, you feel small and you feel awe. Maybe, maybe it's the day that you had kids. That for sure was it for me. I looked at this little baby that was born and I was like, no way. Just deeply struck with awe. And I'm just telling you, nothing in this universe should fill us with more awe and wonder than this, that we can grasp the supreme glory of the God of the universe because he took on a body and became a human and dwelt among us. Does it strike you with awe? Does it fill you with wonder? Because this is such a bewildering and wild and wonderful thing that you will either completely reject it as some sort of fantasy or you will wonder and worship the God who became a man. Those are really your only two options. John the Baptist, he recognized it. He honored Jesus for his glory. He says in verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, really simply, that's just John saying, this Jesus who was born six months after me, he existed before me. He's recognizing here the eternality of Jesus in this amazing statement. We're not gonna spend time on it because John is actually gonna say this exact same thing next week in our message. The third exclusive experience we get in Jesus is that we grasp supreme glory. The fourth is this. Exclusively in Jesus, I gain sufficient grace. I gain sufficient grace. Verse 16. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. He says from his fullness, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And the the New Testament oftentimes is speaking of this as his fullness, his capacity. Colossians 1.19 says, for in him the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. And the whole idea here is that Jesus has a lot of capacity. If Jesus was a container, he would be a big container. If Jesus was a container, he would be like Mary Poppins' bag. You know, when she rolls up and she's like pulling like lamps and she's pulling like armchairs and she just keeps pulling things out of the bag. It's the whole point is like, it's an infinite container and Jesus has infinite capacity. He's an infinite container, which makes what he says next so amazing because he says that from his fullness, from his infinite capacity, what we've gotten is grace upon grace. We've been given grace upon grace. We often, what we feel, we don't feel like um, abundant and big and full. We oftentimes feel empty and insufficient and we desperately need the abundance that Jesus has to offer. So what spills out of Jesus's abundance, what spills out of Jesus's fullness is grace and praise God for that because that is what we need more than we need anything else in this world. I wonder what you would say if I asked, what's your greatest need? Like, if you only had one greatest need, maybe you would say like, well, I gotta breathe. Maybe I need food. Maybe I need oxygen. What is your greatest need? I'll tell you this. Your greatest need is grace from God. 
even beyond your, your physical existence. It is grace from God that you desperately need. And from Jesus's fullness, we have all the grace we will ever need. He tells us in two ways about the sufficiency of his grace. First, it's sufficient in supply. It's sufficient in supply. That's what he means by saying this phrase, grace upon grace. This has been translated a bunch of different ways. Some translations say something like grace in place of grace, grace on top of grace, grace after grace that was already given. The whole point of all of these translations is that it is more grace than you need. It is grace upon grace upon grace. And as soon as you get a dispensation of God's grace, as soon as you get some of God's grace, which is just his unmerited favor. It is his kindness and his generosity to you that you don't have to earn and could never earn anyways, or else it wouldn't be grace. When you get some of his grace and it feels like it's fading away or it's not gonna be enough, another helping of grace is in its place and more grace and then more grace on top of that. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. That's the idea here. Like being in a restaurant and your cup never even gets between, it never even gets like halfway empty because the waitress just keeps filling it up with water, you know? It's grace upon grace upon grace. Like, like waves that just keep pounding the shore, wave after wave after wave. That's the picture of this grace. It never runs out, it never runs dry, it never stops. So no matter what situation you are facing this morning, no matter what baggage, no matter what heaviness you carried into this room, no matter what shame or guilt or confusion or hardship you are bearing, there is grace for you in the person of Jesus Christ. There is grace that is sufficient in supply to handle whatever it is that you are going through and God's not reluctant to give it to you. God is not holding back, God is not hiding, In fact, I would say that by virtue of the fact that you are in this room this morning under the sound of my voice, God is reaching out to you and saying, I want to give you grace. You feel like what you have is not enough. I want to give you more grace. I want to give you grace upon grace. I want to love you and help you and heal you and restore you. That's what God wants for you if you would just avail yourself to the grace Grace is not just sufficient in supply or in amount, but it's also sufficient in capability. It's sufficient in what it can do. Look at this, verse 17, so awesome. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus. The law, you see, the law was good. The law was a kindness from God. The law communicated the standard of God, the way to live in accordance with God's character and God's will, and it was grace to God's people. And yet, grace and truth has now, through Jesus Christ, superseded the law and fulfilled the law so that we can be free from the demands of the law. Because the law was good, but the law was not all that God's people needed ultimately and finally to be redeemed and to be rescued. Why? Because no one can live up to the demands of the law. And that's part of why the law was given to actually illustrate our desperate need for God. And that's what the law does is it reveals the gap that exists between a holy God and sinful people. And the law that revealed that gap, it came through Moses. But the grace that bridged that gap came through Jesus Christ. And praise God for that. This right here, this is what makes the gospel so remarkable. This is what makes the gospel utterly unique in the marketplace of ideas, in all of the schemes that have been dreamed up in human history about how to fulfill your life and make you right with God and deal with your guilt and handle evil in the world. Every single belief system and religion and philosophy falls in one of two ditches. It is only grace or it is only truth. So think about this. There are systems that are gonna tell you about how to get right with God that are only grace. And what that is, is this sort of like moral weakness or cowardice that just makes a mockery of justice by saying, it's not that big of a deal. We can just like sweep it under the rug. God doesn't really care. Don't worry about it. And that, not if, not if it's the God I know, not if it's the holy God from the Bible, that'll never work. Only grace will never suffice, but also only truth. 
because only truth is an impossible demand to meet a perfect standard that none of us can ever live up to. And how many religious systems out there do you know that say, yeah, you just, you just be good enough. If you just act right enough, if you just clean yourself up enough and you're like, I've been trying that. I got nowhere. I'm still just as lost and still just as lonely as I was before. And the bar is still over my head. I can't even please myself, let alone some God or some other standard. I fail myself on a regular basis. So when we fall into the ditches of only grace or only truth, we find a system of salvation that is inadequate to account for all of our human experience and all that God has revealed to us. But this is what makes the biblical gospel so stunning. It is grace and it is truth. And this is the character of God on full display in the work of Jesus Christ. It is tender compassion and it is unrelenting wrath. It is judgment and it is mercy. And in the cross of Jesus Christ, we find those two things in perfect harmony. Loved ones, this is the wonder of the cross. This is the hope that we so desperately need. On the cross, God's grace is fully given out and God's truth, God's justice is fully upheld. Because on the cross, God's wrath was fully poured out on Jesus Christ and his justice was executed to the fullest degree and the demands of his holiness have been satisfied perfectly through the death of his son in our place and yet, because it was a substitutionary death, because he went in our place so that we didn't have to, his compassion and his kindness and his mercy have been poured out at the cross. This is why the cross is the only hope for our sin to be paid for and our relationship with God to be made right because it is the meeting place of grace and truth. It is our only hope that we actually have a God who is holy enough to deal with sin, but we have a God who is loving enough to save sinners like you and me. That's why Jesus is so important and that is the grace that we desperately need in our lives. A holy God who doesn't wink at sin or sweep it under the rug, who deals with it and deals with it fully but deals with it in a way that allows us as sinners to be rescued and ransomed and justified. So is your life, is your life marked by and marveling at the grace of God. Because if it's not, if the grace of God is not your only hope at salvation, you are still running on the treadmill of moral performance that will take you nowhere, that will leave you hopeless and lost and ultimately on the day that you stand before God and you say, God, look at what I did, wasn't I good enough? The answer will be no because the standard is perfection and you will end up separated from God for eternity because no one is good enough. No one measures up. But that's why grace is so valuable because it is available to anyone anywhere at any time who would just admit their need for it and who would run to Jesus and say, I need your grace. I need you to live in my place and satisfy the law's demands. I need you to die in my place and take away the wrath of God from me. And I need you to rise from the dead so that my death and my hell has been wiped away forever in resurrection power. I need you, Jesus. And you can have him. You can receive him, the one who is full of grace and truth. Give up your own way, give up your own strength, give up your own performance, and gain the sufficient grace of God for you. And then this, the last exclusive experience in Jesus. Exclusively in Jesus, I know special revelation. I know special revelation Look at verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. As a fitting end to this prologue, we, uh, John introduces us to this idea that Jesus is the pinnacle of all of God's revelation. 
Revelation, that word just means God revealing himself, God showing himself to the world, communicating himself. And God has been communicating to the world since the moment the world began. And what the Bible tells us is that there's a kind of this revelation that is clear enough for every person who has ever lived to be accountable to God. It's called general revelation. That because of what you can know about yourself and about the universe, because of the power of God, the creator on display, you know enough through general revelation to be accountable to God. But no one knows enough unless God gives out his grace to know him in a saving way, to know him in a way that will rescue us from our sin and repair our relationship to him. And John is saying here, if you really want to know God and you want to know him in a saving way, if you want to know and see the God that no one can see, here's where there's this amazing paradox. He says, no one has ever seen God. And the reason is because God is first, God is, God is a spirit, God, in his essence, is not a physical being. He's a spiritual being that we can't see with our eyes. We can't see with our physical eyes. And on top of that, we are sinful, fallen creatures who don't have the right nor the capability to be in God's presence. It's like what God says to Moses, you would be incinerated if you actually saw me. God is spirit and we are sinful and Jesus in his incarnation has made a way to circumvent both of those realities so that God can be seen. God is spirit and yet the divine second person of the Trinity took on human flesh and became a physical person so we could look at him, so we could see him. And then this, we're sinful, but Jesus died so we could be cleansed so that we're, we're fit to be in God's presence. So Jesus, through his life, through his incarnation, through his ministry, he has made the invisible God visible to us in special revelation. This says that he is at the Father's side. At the Father's side, that's also translated, he he is in the Father's bosom. I, for one, am glad we went a different direction with this word. Bosom's not a word we use anymore. I prefer at the Father's side. It just means he's close to God. It means he's in loving, intimate relationship with God for all time. He knows and understands God completely because of his relationship to him, and then he makes it his life mission. He makes it his task in his incarnation and his ministry to make God known to us, to reveal to us what he knows about the Father. It's almost what it would be like if you had the task of learning a very complex academic subject and you had to learn it in a language you didn't know. What what would be your hope for that? You're like, I don't even know the language, let alone the subject material. How can I learn the subject material if I don't even know the language? You would need both a translator and a tutor to make any sort of headway in that. And that's a little glimpse of what Jesus has done for us with God, the God who is invisible, the God who is infinite, the God who can't be seen. Jesus is the translator and the teacher who makes him visible and understandable to us. And this is why this is such a grace, because all of us want to know what God is like. All of us want to know what God is like. This is the most persistent and perpetual question that human beings have asked forever. They ask, is there a God and what is he like? People from all times and all cultures, every corner of the globe, in every society have asked, is there a God? And if there is, what is he like? And if you are looking for an answer to that question, what is God like? You need to look no further than Jesus Christ. He is how you know what God is like. He's how you see him. So look at Jesus and see all of God's holiness and his compassion and his love and his wisdom and his power. It's on full display in the person and work of Jesus. And that is why we are gonna spend so long in the book of John gazing at Jesus because we want to see God and we want to know him. We want to have a full experience of God and we know that, that is, that's dependent upon the exclusivity of Jesus. Here's a couple questions to take into your week, learning to live. 
This is so that we're not just getting theoretical information. This is so that we are actually living out what God's word says. So these questions are meant to interact with your life. So maybe write them down, talk about them with a friend, take them to coffee, take them to a group that you go to. Here's the first one. What's the story of my experience with God? Do you have an experience with God? Have you encountered God? And have you had a full experience of him through the person of Jesus Christ? And if so, for your sake and for the sake of others, take a few minutes and recount that story. What is your story of encountering God's grace? Second, where is my greatest need for grace? This text tells us that God, through Jesus, has made grace upon grace available to us. Where is that grace, where is that kindness desperately needed in your life? What, what battle against sin or what trial or what difficulty or what area of weakness do you just need God to invade your space with overwhelming grace for you? Because he's willing to do it if you would humble yourself and get on your knees before him and ask for his mercy, ask for wisdom. He will give generously to you. He'll give you grace upon grace. And three, who needs to know that I know God? If you've been given the unbelievable grace of having special revelation, you've seen God in the person of Jesus Christ and you trust him by faith, who needs to know that you know that? Who needs to to be impacted by the knowledge that God has given you by his grace? Because there are people in all of our circles who are lost and who are wandering and who are looking and searching and we have seen God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so it's our duty and our joy to share what we know with a lost and dying world. So I wonder for you in, the, in this room, is your, is your experience of God, does it feel stunted? Does it feel cold? Does it feel non-existent? Maybe you just feel discouraged as you come into this place this morning. Maybe you feel unmoved by the wonder of God's glory. Maybe you feel detached from his grace, like you don't have any grace. Like I'm describing like wave on wave and you're like, I would love just a drop. I feel like I don't have any of it. Maybe you can't see his revelation and you don't know him. The good news is that he is not reluctant. He's not hiding, he's not running from you. He is patient and he is ready and willing if you would humble yourself and come to him and say, God, I need you. If you would shut off your phone long enough to focus on him, you would get alone with the scriptures and you would speak to him and you would cry out to him from the depths of your heart and tell him what you need. Confess your faith in Jesus Christ and ask for his help. He would open the floodgates of his mercy to you and you would experience this grace upon grace. He has done all of it. He has shown you his beauty and offered you his help and given you his revelation. He's done it all through the person and work of Jesus. And he's done it only through Jesus. The promise of his word is that you can experience life in his name. Run to him, trust him, believe in him, know him, obey him, live for him, and watch the fullness of life flourish in your existence. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the fact that we, through your son Jesus, get to experience grace upon grace. That's what we need more than anything else in the world. We need you and we need your kindness. We need your love. So God, I pray that you would help us to see Jesus for who he is. We would not be scared off by the fact that he's the only way, but we would actually fall to our knees in humble gratitude that there is a way and we would run to him the way, the truth, and the life and we would receive him and we would have our lives changed by him and we would be conformed into his image. God, we need your help for this so that we worship Jesus and adore Jesus and give all the glory to Jesus. God, I pray that his name would be louder than any other song that we sing, that he would be lifted high above every one and everything else because only through him can we experience you. So we love you and we thank you and we pray all of these things in his name, amen.